Marcus, what's up, man? Great to have you here. What's good? Thanks. Glad to be here. Glad to see everybody. I was ready. We should, I'm going to start, we're just going to sort of address the elephant in the room because uh, it is 7.48 the night before the trade deadline. <laughs> and I feel like, I feel like I had certain years of my career where my name was popping up around the deadline. I feel like every year of Marcus's career, your name pops up around the deadline. Have you had a good night of sleep in mid-February prior to the deadline in your career? Actually, I have every night, every <laughs> night. Um, it's just what it is, you know. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, as you know. Uh, it's part of it. It's part of it, you know. Um, you control what you can control, you know. And, and unfortunately, those things out of your control, you know, you go out there and let your game do the talking. Have you ever been stressed out by this stuff? Because you're such a chill dude. It feels like this has been your mentality since you were in college. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I mean... You know, um, I just always bet it on myself, and um, that's just how I was raised. And, you know, you can see it with the way I play, and that's just what it is. Like I said, you know, um, you just control what you can control, and everything else falls in line. The, the, can you describe the feeling to the fans, though? I, and I know you say you're not losing sleep, but there is, there is a feeling at 3.01 p.m. on Thursday, at 3.02 p.m., that comes over you. When you have not been traded and your name's been in the rumor mail, what is that feeling like? Uh, it feels good. It, it is a feeling. Um, although, you know, I don't lose sleep. Um, some of my teammates do. And, um, <laughs> you know, so um, and each and every year, you know, they're looking at me like, how you do it? Like, how do you, you know, you're still here. And I'm like, you know, um, I, like I told you, I just let my game do the talking. But there is the feeling. You know, to, to finally, you know, be able to just go play ball. You don't have to worry about all those other things anymore. And, uh, you know, all your energy can go to where it needs to be, and it's on the court. I was traded twice. Um, and if you listen to the show, I've talked about this before. The first time I got a call, my seventh year in Orlando, from my agent about 1.30 Eastern time. You're in the clear. You're good to go. We're in Dallas going to Memphis. I get to the airport. Uh, the coach starts pulling everybody aside that's involved with the trade. I get a call at 259 from uh, Rob Hannigan. Uh, thank you, JJ. We've traded you to the Bucks. Uh, just wanted to keep you in the loop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, uh, and then again, if you've listened to the pod, you know that I absolutely eviscerated David Griffin last year, so I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> Our buddy Nate Jones, who reps uh, Dame, you know, I'm sure you know Nate. Uh, he had this great tweet the other day talking about there's a group of basketball fans who care more and get more excited about transactions than they do the actual basketball on the court. There's a certain amount of hype and excitement on NBA Twitter. Uh, I was at ESPN this week, so I can co-sign this on ESPN. The week of the deadline that we get a draft, free agency. Is that frustrating as a player that our game doesn't get as talked about as much as the transactions around teams? Oh, definitely. You know, you put in that hard work and it's like, this is what you're focusing on? <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, it, it is, man. It's, it's, like I said, you know, you put that hard work in and, you, you know, you go out every night and, you, you know, you, you put your heart out there and, you know, um, they always pick something that has nothing to do with all the hard work you put in to, to portray. And, and that's the sad part about it. But it's a business. And, you know, I tell a couple of my teammates this all the time. You know, we're in entertainment business. Business, uh, you know, first. So, you know, if you when it comes to business, you can't have it personal. You know, and uh, you go out there and you do what you're supposed to do. And, you know, you keep it business-wise. And, and that's what it is. I want to say that uh, Jalen's the only guy from the 2017 Eastern Conference Final Team, correct? I want to say it's just you and him. Yeah. You have had, we're going to get to your success in the last 17 games in a second, but you have had I, what I would describe as, as an amazing amount of roster turnover in your time with the Celtics. And there's been expectations and certainly now there's been some front office changes and some coaching changes. But is it fair to have 
high expectations when there is close to no continuity year to year on the roster? It is, you know, um, especially in what they like to call title town here. <laughs> it's it's a lot. It's a lot. They don't care about the continuity. You know, you'll get that. But, you know, when you put that jersey on, you know, it's a standard that, that you must abide by and that, you know, if you're not really with it, then you can keep it pushing. And, you know, um, it, they, they did that. You know, they've earned that. You know, they've proven that time after time. And, and uh, you know, it's part of it. You, you got to embrace it. And if you don't, then, you know, you're in the wrong spot, you know. And uh, so it definitely is. Well, we've talked about this with Jason a few times, but I'm curious about the narrative around this and that, you know, take uh, the first – Eastern Conference run in 2017, and then we're going to get to the Philly series. But in 2018, where you guys really, you know, overachieved and you, exe- you exceeded expectations of what everybody thought, and so you're there. Does it ever feel like, you know, if you guys don't get to that place, that you you're like pissing people off when it's really like it's really fucking hard to get to the Eastern Conference Finals every year? Like it's not a thing that you can just do just because. Man, JJ, no, he's played here. He's played. He's played against us. He he hears that crowd. It definitely is. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been here through it all. I've been here through Rondo. We got rid of Rondo, you know, brought in Jameer. Then Jameer's gone. Then Kyrie. Kyrie Kimba's gone. I've been here for it all. You know, those roster changes, we've had, you know, it's just like, wow. Each and every year, why not to expect to be, you know, in the Eastern Conference Finals every year at least. That's, you know, the least we can do. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's rightfully so. You know, we've earned that, they've earned that, and we just got to go out there and embrace it and take it all in, and that's it. Later on in the show, by the way, we are doing a draft tonight. We will discuss more about the Boston fan base. I'll just, I'll leave you with that. I'll leave you with that cliffhanger right there. Uh, Marcus, let's go back a little bit. I want to go back to your background and where you grew up and how you grew up. Can you just provide us with some details of your upbringing and how you ended up going to Oklahoma, o- o- Oklahoma State? Definitely. Now, <clears throat> I'm the youngest of four boys. Um, I lost my oldest brother at the age of when he was 33. I was, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, 11. I just turned 11. Uh, or getting ready to turn 11 um, to cancer. Um, he... he Fought that battle for 18 years. He was diagnosed at the age of 15 with lung cancer. He played basketball. He actually played basketball with uh, a Duke alum, um, Thomas Hill. Oh, yeah. At Lancaster High oh, School. Yeah. And uh, it's been quoted that Thomas Hill said the best player on the team at the time was my brother at the time. And if he didn't get sick, he would probably be in the NBA. So um, the youngest, um, my mom and dad, um, you know, worked their butts off day in and day night uh, to, to provide for me and my family. Um, it was nights where we didn't know if we were going to eat. It was nights where my mom didn't know if she was going to eat, trying to provide for us. Um, and in third grade, you know, um, I was finally started playing basketball. I used to play football before I ever played basketball. That was my first love. Got introduced to the game of basketball. Um, and met a really good friend of mine named Philip Forte, who I ended up going and playing AAU basketball with also going to the same high school and then on to college to, to, to my collegiate level. And um, funny story, uh, I could talk about it now. <laughs> um, when I first met Phil, um, Phil Forte uh, Jr., which is his dad, he's the third, um, he asked me in fifth grade to, to move up to Flyer Mound with him and come play with his son. And I'm just like, uh, I don't really know you like that. <laughs> All my family's here in Dallas, man. I'm gonna just stay here. Um, going, on, going on seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade comes. A week into my ninth grade year, I'm at Red Oak High, uh, high School. Uh, I'm just like things. This is just not where I where I where I thought they would be right now. So I gave him a call and um, asked him, "Is that you know if he still wanted me to come up there?" And once again, me and his son, we've been playing together since third grade already. So it's a good friendship of mine, good friend of mine. And, he said, yeah, so we moved up there, and, you know, that's kind of where my journey began. I, I went on to win two state championships back-to-back, uh, 115 wins and only six losses in three years, um, and only one home loss. Um, so, you know, that kind of kicked it off for me. Um, and then how I got to Oklahoma State, um, 
me and Phil actually decided that we weren't going to play basketball together anymore after high school. Um, he just didn't want to be in my shadow. You know, I thought he needed more. Um, that's just what it was. You know, he's like my little brother. Uh, Mar Marcus was a McDonald's All-American. <laughs> yeah, so, you know it's what I'm like, saying? It's just, it's a that's, point. that's what it was. He was like my little brother, you know. Um, so I actually, um, he calls me one day on the weekend. It's a Friday. He's like, yo, listen, just go with me. I'm taking, you know, my official visit to Oklahoma State. Just come with me. You know, I don't want to go by myself. I'm like, all right, cool. As long as I'm back before Sunday, because I have a house meeting where Roy Williams for North Carolina, he's flying in to meet me. So I said, like, I gotta be back home. All right. He's like, cool, cool. So Dallas to Oklahoma State is about a four hour drive. So it's not far. So we take the drive. We get there. Um, Travis Ford at the time was the coach and uh, the whole coaching staff, you know, they come, they greet us. And it's me, his dad, we're in the back. And, um, you know, they take film and they just, walk away from me and they just go on there talking and, you know I'm just in the back just talking to his dad and about two hours into the whole interaction they come back and they're like sorry Marcus like we just want you to understand like we understand that we're not talking to you right now give me that much attention um we understand that you have a house meeting with Roy Williams and that you're a five-star recruit and everybody's out there and we probably won't get you but we still won't feel every other school that called including North Carolina was asking, if we get Phil, will you come? Like, as a package. And I was like, nah, that's not how this is going down. So they were the only school to come at us separately, which inevitably I ended up choosing because of that. <laughs> um, and that was, that was a hard day for me. I had to call every college coach back that day um, and tell them that um, I just committed to Oklahoma State um, out of the blue. Um, <laughs> It was kind of random. Nobody in the college world understood the decision, didn't know what was going on. When I called North Carolina to talk to Roy Williams, his assistant picked up and told me uh, he didn't want to talk to me and hung up in my face. So it was it was a lot. It was a lot for that. So that's that's the story of how I Coach got Coach K would never. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. That's how I became, uh, you know, Oklahoma State Cowboy and um, – I think it was probably the best decision that I've ever made. You know, um, Travis Ford was the only coach that when talk, talking to me in um, recruiting, said, I'm gonna put the ball in your hands and let you be the playmaker that I know you can be and that I've seen you, you know, what you've been doing in high school. And and, um, and it, that right there just kind of jump-started my career from then on. You know, I knew that I could make it at the next level. So we looked this up today, you had, you had 99 steals as a freshman. At OK State, it's just wild. Um, was there any learning curve, or was it just like you get in there and it's like, let's go? Um, no, it was. I was thrown in the fire right away. I, I went. Um, I went to the All, All American game straight from the All American game. I went to the Junior uh, USA team. We went to Brazil and played. I played with a couple guys that's in the league now. Um, and then when I got back to Oklahoma State, it was the first time that they allowed collegiate level teams to go out of the country and play. So we ended up going to the Canary Islands, Madrid and Barcelona for like two months before school started. When I got back, I was already into a summer workout. It was, it was a wrap, like it's time to go. I didn't have time to really adjust to the college life. I was I was right into it and, and that was it. And we was off running races. It was that bad that I got ran into the ground that I actually got really sick during our midnight madness and I couldn't play because I was sick and in the hospital. That's how bad I got and I was so dehydrated that I had IVs in me trying to give me fluid because I was just so ran down and so I was right into it off the rip. You had a great freshman year and you were projected to be by some mock drafts, a top pick, but definitely a top five pick. I've never asked you this. Why, why the fuck did you go back to school <laughs> for one more year? I mean, I could understand if you were at Duke, but you were at Oklahoma State, you know? <laughs> right, right, see? Yeah, that's, that's the question. That's the million dollar question, you know? Um, and, and it's funny, everybody thinks, and it's especially with the whole scandal that came out with, you know, and Nike, Adidas, and everybody. And, one of our coaches at Oklahoma State was actually, you know, kind of one of the main culprits in that. And they went all the way back to, to the year that I was there for records and everything. But I came back and not because I was paid. They didn't give me any money. No incentives. It was no incentives. 
Um, truly because growing up, I didn't really have a childhood. You know, I became the man of my family very early once I lost my brother. Um, that was kind of it. It was kind of like, you're the last one um, of us to, to, to get us out of here, out of our situation. So I didn't really have a childhood. You know, basketball was my life. So when I got to college, I'm like, dang, like I got a room to sleep in. I was sleeping on the couch at the crib. I'm the youngest. I'm like, dang, I got to fight for the bathroom with three other guys, like two other guys. Like, come on, man. Like, I got my own room. Like, I'm loving college right now. I'm loving it. And, um, you know, I get to play with my best friend. And um, so I was like, you know what? I can give it one more shot. You know, the NBA isn't going anywhere. Um, it also gave me an opportunity to learn more about the business side of it and get ready. And, um, you know, I decided that. And it was crazy because I didn't, I didn't decide until the last game. Uh, we got pushed out the first round NCAA tournament uh, against Gonzaga, actually. And um, all the questions were, what are you going to do? And I'm like, man, I don't know. Like, I just want to get the hell out of here right now. And my, my teammates was like, what's going on? And so I had this big press conference, and I decided to come back. And, you know, I, I heard it all from I'm, I'm dumb. What am I doing? I cost myself millions. Like, um uh, Teams are going to pass up me. I'm just going to fall in the in the draft and everything like this. Uh, the next day, I took out 15 million dollars in insurance policy uh, with the school, and uh, I told the school, I said, "Listen, I'm be real with y'all. I'm not going to class. <laughs> we need a new jumbotron. Like, let's get this going." And ironically, I didn't go to class, and we got a new jumbotron. <laughs> And I came back, but um, but no, nah, no. Nah. I really, I was really loving the college experience, and so I decided to come back. What What are your What are your memories of draft night? Memories of draft. Oh man. Ooh, it was. I remember. So I have this draft jacket that I wore. And it was specially uh, made, and um, when my mom, when she was still living, she was there. So the, the jacket, it has like my tattoos. I have certain tattoos of my brother that passed away. Um, it had everything that was special to me, Oklahoma State, uh, my high school, uh, alma mater, um, all that, you know, where I'm from, you know, everything, Dallas, all of it. So it was like a tribute to her. Um, and I was able to show her that on actual draft night and she cried and um, it was one of the flyest dudes at draft. You know what I'm saying? So it was awesome. Tommy and I were talking earlier, and there are certain players in my career that I, I respected, of course, that I hated playing against. And I would put you in that category. <laughs> um, thank you. I said it many, many times. <laughs> Actually, a couple, I have a couple questions sort of about that. You know, your, your mentality going into a game, for a guy like me, I thought about my shooting, I thought about what whatever defensive matchup I had. Um, I thought about winning, of course. But there's a – when you play the way you do, with the edge, the competitiveness, um, the extra, <laughs> the extra, um, what's that mentality before a game? What, what are you telling yourself? A couple things. One is um – just, just, just don't get that dun 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 sound. I didn't want that. So, um, do everything you can to 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 stop that. Um, but no, you know, for me, it's uh, my brother didn't have this opportunity to live out his dream. It was taken away from him very early. So every time I step on that floor, if I'm not giving it everything I have, then you know everything that he did and taught me. It's just in vain, and, you know, I can't have that. So my mentality is just to go out there and leave it all on the court as if it was my last game because at any given day, it could be. Is there, is there guys that you don't enjoy playing against? Are there, are there certain guys where before the game you're thinking to yourself, there's going to be some bullshit tonight? Because <laughs> that's what I thought when I played against you. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a couple guys. I mean, um, you know um, – for me, KD, he talks a lot of shit. So it's like, you know, and you know, he's one of the best to do it on his end, and I'm one of the best to do it on my end. So it's like we're bumping heads, but it's like, God damn, he got like five feet on me. What am I supposed to do? You know, so, but no, nah, you love those type of battles though. You were one of them, you know, every night 
when when coach put your name up there and he's like matchups Marcus you got JJ I'm looking at him like you know I just got back from conditioning like I'm not fully ready to 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 do a track meet all night like I know I know I'm gonna have to chase him all night and get hit by every illegal screen there is like I'm not ready for that right now. and you know he's looking at me like yeah whatever like you got him tonight and you know I, uh, all that goes out the window when it's time and you know I have to put my running shoes on and get ready to run. No naming names, or you can if you want, but I'm not expecting you to. But are there guys that you either know going in or you get out on the court with them and you're like, they are they are not ready for this? Like you can see it in their face that they're not oh, ready yeah. for this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You definitely can. Like I'm, sure, I'm sure JJ's had a time where he's like, oh, this guy's can't guard me. He, it's just that feeling, you know. There's times where I go on the court and I'm like, I look at a guy – or he, you know, he talking to me, you know, especially a rookie. Don't let you be a rookie. If you're a rookie and you're trying to talk to me, like, <laughs> it's over for you. You know what I'm saying? I got you. you friendly. It's, it's a wrap, you know? You know, I'm, I'm you know, tap you on your shoulder and I'm going to take the rock and we're going to go the other way. Um, we actually, uh, <clears throat> Jason, our video guy, who's very talented, uh, and made that video earlier. Let's give Jason a round of applause, by the way. We greatly appreciate Jason. Jason actually, uh, it, we could dim the lights. Jason and I compiled a, uh, a highlight video of Marcus. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. That we want to watch here. Smart. to Marcus giving me uh, eight stitches uh, in a second. But when I say extra, <laughs> y'all now know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, when I, so when I talk about mentality, look, there's the competition part. There's the physicality. Um, you and Jalen in that playoff series in my two years in Philly, y'all having to chase me around. Even Jalen my last year in that game, actually, uh, he got the start and he chased me around my last year in L.A., I knew what I was in for, but the extra stuff. You wasn't ready for it. When do you make that decision? Like, you know what? I'm gonna flop here. I'm gonna run into Pascal Siakam <laughs> and jump seven feet that way. <laughs> oh wow! Well, that play it was it was it was actually strategical with that one. So, <laughs> you know, they just put in the new challenge rule, and they, you know, that's a that's a. Um, you know, a playoff game. So in my mind, I'm thinking, if I can get the ref to call it in my favor, what is Toronto going to do? They're going to challenge it, which means they're going to use their challenge that they cannot have in the fourth quarter, and we still have ours. And it actually worked that game because it was a big play where it could have went their way if they had their challenge that kind of would have won them the game and, you know, even that series out. So it actually worked out perfect. <laughs> When did, you, when did you really feel like you learned this? Ah, <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know exactly where I learned. I was a little bit of everything I watched before my time. NBA players doing it. You watch all the overseas guys come over here, and you know they started it, and uh, <laughs> it worked. It worked for them. Oh so you God. know, you're like, okay, I take a little bit of that, put it in my game, and and see how it goes, and. You know, and it, what better way? It's no, it's no better feeling when you know you 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 get a guy to to you bait him into a trap, get him thrown out the game, get a foul called on him, and he just goes ballistic. It's one of the best feelings in the world. Back back to the stitches. Um, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, 
the one game we won in the 2018 series, which was 2018, uh, I drew three offensive fouls that game. Two against you because you kept trying to post me up. And in one of the plays, again, you kicked your leg out and you landed on my toe and I sprained my big toe and I couldn't walk right for like a month. So that's two injuries because of Marcus. So you're telling me that was a foul on me? I'm, I'm, I'm going to contest a shot. Hold on, I'm going to contest a shot. You shot faked. I leaned forward and got out of your shooting space and then you launched yourself into me. <laughs> and your elbow caught my eye. I mean, you're a shooter, you, you understand it. You're right, it's, I, we got it from you guys. You know, you gotta learn, you know, you guys, you guys flop a lot when it's time to get the call, but you hate when guys flop against you. Well said. Well said. Well said. I see no lies. <laughs> see no lies. There, for the average fan, not the Boston Celtics fans, the average fan, um, do you sense that uh, the average NBA fan, a casual NBA fan, doesn't quite understand your value? because your counting stats maybe don't jump out, your shooting percentages are what they are. Um, and so I'm obviously teasing Marcus here with this bullshit, but they don't understand your value because of the winning plays that don't show up on a box score, um, the unselfishness, the hockey assists, just playing the game the right way and competing at a high level. Definitely. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, we could sit here and talk about this. My shooting, we can start with that. I mean, you know, um, probably, you know, not the best shooter in the world, you know, it's okay. But- Your form's great. Form's Your great, form's, form's great. amazing. It's, let's get that, form's amazing. You know, on any given night, you, I could be a problem for you. You know, so just be ready. And let's not forget, I still hold the record for most threes in the game, in the self shooting I'm Just saying, but. It's, it's, it's a popularity contest. You know it as much as I do. It's a popularity contest. People have, people, people have guys that they like more than others. So no matter what those guys do, they're always going to be right. No matter what the other guys do, they're always going to be wrong. Um, and that, that's just what it is, unfortunately. You know, I'm, I'm, I play the game to win, you know, and the stats that come, the individual stats that come with it. But for me, it's just about winning. So those people or those fans who are counting just the stats – you know, it just really tells you the knowledge that they have about basketball, you know, being able to encourage your teammate because they're having a bad game by making that extra pass. You know, that means a lot to a guy, especially a younger guy coming in trying to find his own who isn't playing a lot and finally gets in. You know, as a leader, that's what you have to be able to do. You have to be able to sacrifice for your own gain to help benefit somebody else. And that's just how I'm always thinking, you know. I can go out here and, and try and, and, and do what I did at Oklahoma State. You know, and there's going to be nights I'm going to be needed to do that. But we do have two talented guys and Jalen and Jason who, you know, take on that load. You know, and for me, um, it's my job to make sure that I do everything else to help them to, to be ready to take that load on. And do you feel like it's, it's not a coincidence that this shows up in the playoffs? And, and we were talking earlier about the 2018 series against them, specifically about game two, where they were up 22 I think in the second quarter. And then you and you, it was out here, and you and Terry and a bunch of the other guys, like by, the, by halftime it was five, and then by the fourth quarter you were up, and then it was sort of like that's all she wrote uh, for that series. But, but do you feel like, I mean, your numbers have gone up in the playoffs. And every so time. that every, every year, and so that is, is that a thing that, you, that is a, you know, you are approaching things differently or just for whatever reason, you know, it, things fall into place more when it comes to May and June? Oh, the May and June is where you want to be hitting your peak, you know. And for me, you know, I'm always hitting my peak at the right time. So, um, you know, regular season, you know, everybody, nobody really cares about regular season, you know. <laughs> okay, you did it. Yep, you, yeah. It's the playoffs that matter. I'm not going to co-sign that. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the going to classic. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it's the playoffs that matter. And that's just what it is, you know, uh, dude. When it's time, when those lights come on and it's time to perform, I'm always going to do that. 
I want to make one comment about Marcus's shooting. So generally speaking on the scattering report, if Marcus is in a pick and roll, you go under the screen. Um, there were times, uh, especially with the Sixers, where I would be in a full help position guarding Marcus, and that was the game plan. And <clears throat> they were like, don't even close out to him. Just let him shoot. Yeah. And what happened every game? You'd hit four or five threes. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> yeah. Great scattering report, guys. <laughs> Great scattering report. Speaking of peaks, um, you guys are 13 and 4 in your last 17. I think you were 18 and yep. yeah. we, we talk we talked with Jason today about this. You guys were 18 and 21. He made a comment about just um, you know, those conference finals runs, two out of his first three years. You've been to three now. You almost take it for granted. Um, you're up to second overall in defense and four and a half games out of first place as the play-in team, as one of the play-in teams, which is crazy. Can you remember a time in your career where a conference felt as wide open as the Eastern Conference this year? Um, it would actually be, for me, um, I forgot what year it was that – um, will LeBron be this in game seven? 18. 18. So 18 was probably that for us. We, we, we definitely thought that we had a, a great chance. And to this day, we still thought if we went to the championship instead of LeBron and those guys, we definitely would have beat Golden State that year. Wow. Wow. I really thought, I really thought we were going to beat you guys. What's interesting, we talked with Jason about this too. What's interesting, that, that whole run up as to the end of the regular season that year, um, Kyrie had, had been declared out for the season. Gordon obviously had hurt himself uh, the opening night. So he was out for the season. And you guys still were in the second spot. And so we were sort of battling with Cleveland for that third seed. We wanted the third seed to face you guys in the, first, in the second round, I mean. And then there were all these teams – they were battling to basically lose into or win into the seven seed so they could face you in the first round. Um, obviously, that didn't work out for anybody really in the Eastern Conference. Um, what was the what was the magic of that 2018 team? If you had to encapsulate the magic of that team without Kyrie, without Gordon, a bunch of young guys, Jason in his rookie year, Terry Rozier, you uh, obviously Jalen as well. What was the magic? Go get them. That was it for us. That was our mentality. Go get them. Like, we're young guys who are very talented, and we're ready now, you know. So whoever was in our way, you know, we were going to knock them down. And that's just how we felt each game, you know. And Scary Terry was, was born, as we all know. And then shout out to Terry. So we were – it was, it was a different type of feel. We felt that, you know, no matter who you put in front of us that year that – you know, it was going to be a dogfight. Yeah. Well, we appreciate everyone that um, saw this box, grabbed a note card, and wrote a question down um, for us. We wanted to do a little Q&A, try something different here. Um, generally speaking, this is a secret of the show. When we do Q&As uh, in a mailbag episode, it's Tommy writing out the questions. Um, he makes Says up, you. We get, he, a, lot of, we get he, a lot of good fan He mail. makes up a name. He makes up a name, and he makes up a location. Uh, one time we got a, a question from Chelsea from Brooklyn. That's my wife. It's, it could be a coincidence. I don't know. All right. All right. This is from Chloe who submitted multiple questions. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, this is for Marcus. Who is your favorite player on another team other than the Celtics? Favorite player on another team other than the Celtics. Hmm. I'm going to probably have to go with Zach Levine and the Chicago Bulls. Oh, wow. Interesting. It's a good one. Um, Tommy, why don't you read this? Because I think this question is for me. Okay. JJ, were you ever close to signing in Boston? Multiple times. <laughs> Explain. Uh, well, in 2010, uh, I was convinced. I had a really good conference finals against Boston. And I got word. I was convinced that they were going to give me five-year contract, full mid-level. Uh, but then Perk got hurt in game six of the finals and they used that mid-level to go sign Jermaine O'Neal for three years. So that was the first time. Uh, 2000, 2013, the year I signed with the Clippers, Doc was still the coach. In the weeks leading up, Rondo and I were texting all the time. 
and uh, thought I was going to end up on the team then. My, the year after my first year in Philly, Brad called, Danny called, first night of free agency, after you guys had just beat us in the playoffs. And this is going to sound weird, but they were like, if Marcus leaves, we're going to offer you a contract. <laughs> 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 so you and I wouldn't have played together, guy. <laughs> um, that was when you were, I think you were restricted that year. So uh, this question, clearly not for me. Uh, since you're a good defender, <laughs> who is the hardest person to guard? Oh, man, the hardest person to guard. <clears throat> I'm probably going to, Katie, like I said earlier, I mean, it, I think that, I think anybody He's anybody hardest person to guard. Like I said, at somebody at his size doing that, you got it. I was gonna say we talk to Drew about this all the time. What are you supposed to do with someone that size is that skilled? You just gotta pray. <laughs> That's, about it. Just pray. That's it. <laughs> then you can't do. It. That's what he said too. <laughs> I don't have a name on this one. I wish I did because I'd give them a shout out. Uh, we've all heard that. Quote, JJ drinks his own pee. Oh, wow. <laughs> but what's the best trash talk you've received from an opposing player? <laughs> to be clear, that was Maryland fans my sophomore year. They wrote, a, they wrote that on a sign. That was not a player saying that to me. <laughs> um, I was talking to my girlfriend earlier and my agent about this. Uh, so... Probably have to say the Charlotte Hornets. Oh, excuse me, the Charlotte Hornets game we just played. Um, Kelly Oubre, um, he got a stop on Jalen, and he yells as he's coming down towards our bench. Looks at our bench in the corner and goes, "They can't beat us two on five. And I'm like, and the whole bench is like, "Get on, get on with that." You know what I'm saying? So he comes back down. And I'm like, "Yo, I'm on the bench." And I'm like, "Kelly, like, why are you talking crazy?" He's like, "I got it from you." <laughs> Touche. <laughs> what did you say? Respect. Uh, all right, this is an interesting one. This will be the last one. We'll do the boxes empty. Uh, this is from an admirer. Is Tommy single? <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Who put that in the box? Interesting. We'll get to that. All right. I, I have a question before we get to the draft. In the bubble, when you block that shot, could you... Could you tell right away it was going to happen, or was that all instinct? Definitely, because the the game before he got me with the exact same move, and they called a foul in one, and then he flexed in my face, and then after the game he was talking crazy. So I was like, all right. So <laughs> when when the when he got the ball, instantly my first reaction was I started backpedaling. I'm like, okay, he's gonna here we go again. He's probably gonna think I'm gonna continue to backpedal, and he's gonna do the exact same move. Right? Why would you do the exact same move? So he does the exact same move. I turn my hips into a sprint and he goes up. And in my mind, like, I'm talking, give me that shit before I even block the shot. Like, I'm saying, give me that. And he goes up and I smack him and he started crying for a foul. And, and I'm just like, here we go. Like, I was prepared for it. Like, I told myself, if I get in that position again, like, I'm, I'm blocking it. I'm not even going to give him a chance to get in one. The I was the other thing we need to talk about is the ejection before we draft. But what the ahead. ejection? Your ejection. What are you talking about? Oh yeah, <laughs> guys. I don't know if you guys seen it when when JJ got ejected for throwing the ball at the official. Threw <laughs> <laughs> the ball at the official. He, he did. It's going to tell you guys otherwise, but he he definitely threw the ball at the official. Um, he he was mad. Um, he thought he thought the Celtics were fouling all night. We weren't. And, and, but yeah, he what got was your ejected. reaction when this was happening? Uh, I was dying laughing. <laughs> I, th I thought it was, once again, that feeling, right, that I told you, like, getting underneath another player's skin, and he just loses his mind. It, it, was, it, was, it was everything. A little backstory real quick, just so we're clear. I had a little bit of a rough year last year uh, in the season, and I, I would get emotional before games. It was very odd. I was very, very lonely living alone in an apartment uh, that I couldn't leave unless it was to go to a gymnasium. So Josh Tiven, the referee, comes up to me before the game and he says, JJ, you're, you're really not yourself. What's going on? And I was just like, Josh, I don't know, man. You know, protocols, can't leave our apartment. Uh, my family's in New York. This sucks, man. He's like, ah, I feel for you. I feel for you. 
You know, don't let us steal your joy or something like that. <laughs> okay. So I play five minutes in the first half. I go my run. I get my cardio in, you know, run up and down the court a few times. And I check back in for the second half. And so early on, Aaron uh, Nesmith, uh, he drives and um, I, I legitimately jumped out of the way. And they called an and one. They, they gave him the, the foul uh, on me. And I, I shrugged. Wasn't mad yet. Wasn't mad. We go down to the other end. I try a rip through move. Aaron fouls me. I pass the ball in the post and I turn to Josh and I said, Josh, just so we're clear, that's also foul. <laughs> Josh gave me one of these, which for me is, that's just, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. <laughs> I said, Josh, you can do that, but it's still a fucking foul. <laughs> so he gives me a technical. Um, very next possession, we come down. <laughs> And I, again, I do the rip through, and this time they call a foul, and I'm, I'm tr having a terrible game, a terrible season. I cried for five minutes in the locker room. So I'm trying to get myself amped. I'm trying to see, get myself going here, you know? And uh, I, heard, I heard two whistles, and I thought the referee closest to the scores table was going to charge Aaron with the foul and, and turn the scores table. So I turned to the other referee, which I did not know was Josh, and Tristan was in the way. So I was going to throw it, and then I was like, I'll just spin it around, and I put a little extra English on it. <laughs> Josh was turning to the scores table, it hit him in the leg. That's the story, man. There's no ill will towards Josh. Would you have ejected him? No ill will. Yeah, I would have thrown him out. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we were talking about this, but do you have a favorite ejection of yourself? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I actually do. <laughs> Is that, is that weird to have a favorite No, I'm not surprised. Yourself? That's why I Something asked. you're really proud of. <laughs> oh, I got a few, actually. Oh, okay. Well, one of them is actually a play you've seen on here where I got hit with an illegal screen um, against Portland. They called a foul on Nurkic and then threw me out the game because when he hit me, Natural movement, my arm went up and hit him in his, you know, his man privates. <laughs> and they threw me out. I mean, I wasn't trying to, um, but it happened. A um, um, couple, like my second year in the league, Matt Bonner, same thing happened. Tried to rip through, hit him, got ejected. Um, yeah, I promise I'm not doing this on purpose, guys. <laughs> but uh, those two for sure, uh, and plenty more, but catch me some other day. <laughs> All right, if you listen to the show, you know that we have a draft. Uh, the easy lead-in question to the topic of this draft is a simple question for Marcus. It's something I just talked about that I missed out on three times. What is it like to play in front of Boston Celtics fans? There we go. Stat. It's all of that and more. But no, it's awesome. It's awesome. You know, um, some of the most devoted fans uh, that you would probably ever play in front of. Um, you know, just walking down the street or, you know, some will see me going to the store or something. And, you know, um, I could be having a bad day. And it's, oh, my gosh, you know, you're my favorite player. And, you know, put a smile on somebody's face. And, you know, my, my, my day's lit up. So... Um, the way that they, they cheer for us at the garden, the way that they also boo our ass when we're not doing what we're supposed to do. You know, they, they let us know. They, they, they keep us grounded as well. Only the best fans do. Only the best fans do. See, it's, it's like a, that's like a good friend. You don't want the one that always says yes. You want the one that's going to be honest with you no matter what. And that's Boston fans. Love that. Love that. All right, in honor of that, Tommy, what are we going to draft here? What are we going to draft? So we're drafting um, craziest sports fan bases, any sport, any part of the world. Yeah. Okay, Marcus, so you're up first. I'm going to take Boston. Yeah. No, 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 no. What, 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 what team? It's got to be a team. It can't just be a city. Celtics. Boston Celtics. Okay. Boston Celtics. Good choice. Play into the home crowd. It's fine. All right. It's fine. Um, I'm going to Argentina soccer fans. <laughs> There was, I looked this up in 2014, there were 15, this is kind of dark, but there were 15 soccer related deaths compared to <laughs> yeah, some yeah. of their fans. Like they're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Dedicated, but crazy. Dedicated. Yeah. 
Probably a little too much. Yeah, a little too much. Um, yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I think the natural thing for me to start is in Philly, and I would like to start with 76ers fans, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the Philadelphia Eagles fans because... Wow. I know, but listen, I know. But they, they booed Santa and threw snowballs at Santa. You know, there's... Right. <laughs> It's kind of you know, kind of kind of next level there, um, and then I'm actually going to pick for my second pick in the in second second round. I'm going to pick Kobe Bryant fans, and look, rest in peace, one of the greatest players. Love Kobe, um, but have y'all been on NBA Twitter? <laughs> Kobe has the craziest fans. He does. I agree. Dedicated. Um, I'm going with Bills fans. For my second pick, just ask the tables in Buffalo how they feel. <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, okay. I'm actually gonna go with PSG fans, Paris Saint Germain fans. Ooh, ooh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. PSG is one of my favorite soccer teams, so and their fans are awesome. And I'm also go with. I'm gonna have to go with the Patriots. Yeah. The Patriots fans. Yeah. Listen. I have, a, I have a question being here. Do you feel like all of the winning takes some of the, like you just get used to it at a certain point? You do. You get spoiled. You definitely get spoiled until they lose. And then it's like, oh my gosh, we're nothing. What's going on with this? And they forget all, everything else about the winnings that they had. True. All right. I'm, I'm going, I'm going college. I'm going Alabama football. Okay. It's a good it's choice. A good it's a great one. It's a good choice. Do you remember when the uh, guy poisoned Auburn's tree? Yeah. <laughs> There's varying definitions of crazy. So my my third round, I'm going with Cleveland Browns fans. Ooh. You know what I mean? It's like, at what point do you just stop being a fan? <laughs> um, going with them. And then, you know, I might go back to back here, but <clears throat> Duke just beat UNC. Last weekend. Last game in Cameron uh, for coach against UNC is in a few weeks. Um, so a lot of people ask me about the Duke-UNC rivalry. And uh, there's a lot of uh, douchey people that will come up to me and be like, hey, man, I went to UNC. Fuck Duke. And, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, I have never had any ill will or hatred or anything towards any school's fan bases, especially UNC. Nothing but respect, but fuck Maryland. <laughs> so I'm going Maryland the, for it. Know the feeling. Know the feeling all too well. Yeah. So is Maryland your pick? Maryland's for it. Okay, good pick. Um, I'm gonna take, I think I'm gonna take Knicks fans as my fourth pick. And Knicks fans have just been through a lot. They just have been through a lot, and they're, they keep coming to the games, and they keep buying the tickets, <laughs> and it's just it's not getting any better. Like, this year, it's not been any better, and they just keep showing up. It's a little bit like how the Red Sox used to be, yeah. and the Cubs, I'm a good Cub fan, too, and the Cubs used to be. It was like, once you win, like, I can't pick, I love the Red Sox, I can't pick the Red Sox because they've won all this, this yeah. time. So it's, yeah, like, no shit you're going to the games. Like, Nick fans, Nick fans have nothing going for them, and yet they keep coming. <laughs> they had a riot. So this is like crazy. They had, did you see the riot they had after one playoff win last year? <laughs> had a playoff series win. What they won playoff game. game, they won game. You guys have been to three conference finals in the last six years. They had one playoff win and they rioted in Manhattan. The fact that the Knicks made it to the fourth round, Knicks fans made it to the fourth round. I know. Just, it could have been a first round. That's like, it's oh, like, it could it's been an first oversight. Round. It's great value, Tom. Yeah. It's great value. All right, bro. You got two. Um... I'm going to have to go with, and I know people back home are going to hate me for this, Cowboys fans. It's every year it's the Cowboys year, and every year they're going to do this. They Listen, po they do good in the postseason. When they get to the play playoffs and everything, and it's time to actually perform, it's like, America's team who? <laughs> I think if we did a draft of, of delusional fan bases, Cowboys would certainly be the first pick. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Did you see the memes this year when they lost in the playoffs? I've seen all the memes. <laughs> I've seen them all. Don't worry, my teammates are showing me. <laughs> Thinking because I'm from Dallas that I'm just this diehard Dallas Cowboys fan. I'm like, I'm really not. 
All right, you got one more. One more. Um, I'm also have to go with Texas Tech fans. I think you're asking Google. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do y'all know the backstory on that one? <laughs> All right, we'll let Marcus tell the backstory real quick. All right, so amongst the, me not coming out my freshman year, I'm into my sophomore year. We're playing down in Lubbock, Texas. Um, at this time, we're about to get upset by uh, Lubbock, uh, by Texas Tech on their home court. One of our guys turns the ball over. I go down, chase down, block, referee calls a foul. I fall into the crowd. Some words were exchanged and thrown at me. And then some vulgar words that probably shouldn't be said was also thrown at me. Um, I reacted in a way that, you know, I, I shouldn't have. And um, I pushed a fan. And it's kind of weird because after that, people only knew me as the guy who pushed the Texas Tech fan. They didn't know my name. They just, oh, you that guy that pushed that fan. Yeah, I like you. <laughs> what, like, what, do, what do I, like, you know I'm good at basketball too. Right? Like, I'm a good person, I promise you. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna definitely have to go with them. And um, they're crazy, you know, there's, down south is a little bit different. They don't care. Um, and, and that was definitely a game for me to remember forever. I don't know that vulgar is the right word. I was being nice. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. It was a, yeah. All right. Tommy? I think you learned in, in college that some people are, by the time you got to the pros, you Ignorance were seasoned. Ignorance is bliss. You were seasoned. Um, I'm going to close it out. I'm glad you didn't pick them. I got to take Sixers fans off the board. A couple things. The process. <laughs> <laughs> and then the stuff, I mean, the the stuff with your boy Brian Colangelo is like crazy. <laughs> like it's crazy. Like like everything about everything that happened with that is craziness. And they're a great fan. Like a lot of these fan bases are great. They're a great fan base. They're like the Celtics fans. They show up. They're very dedicated. Um, you know they support the show and everything like that. But they're definitely they're definitely out there. Yeah. No. <laughs> Spot on. Not everybody can handle the Sixers fan base. <laughs> I think there's some similarities there between Celtics fans and Sixers fans. Again, I'm not comparing franchises. Be very clear on that. <laughs> but for the fandom, to your, what you were talking about earlier in terms of holding teams accountable, holding players accountable, I'll take getting booed because I suck that night over just general apathy all day long. I love it. And I've, Every day. And I've played for some fan fan bases where apathy would be the best word to describe them. I'm not talking about the Orlando Magic. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> he took some. He took some king shots earlier. That was yeah. <laughs> I already took a Sacramento king shot earlier today. So, um, look, I, I got to go. Something global here. Something outside of the U.S. Um, I did some googling today on the train ride up here. So I don't know anything about this team. I just have heard that their fan base is crazy. I'm going to go with Celtic FC. All right, I'm going to go with Celtic FC. I heard it's crazy. Fifth round. <laughs> Something about the name Celtic, maybe. Listen, name. Marcus, you and I prepare for these drafts. Clearly, <laughs> the guy doesn't. So, <laughs> I think we, I think we know it's between us. Yeah, but who, exactly. Who's going to come out on top here? Um, I want to just say to everyone that came tonight, thank you so much. Thank you for supporting Marcus. Thank you for supporting his foundation and thank you for supporting our show. Uh, I said this the last time we did a show. Our show literally would not exist without an audience. We wouldn't do it. And we have like the greatest audience in the world. And we appreciate you guys listening to the show. We appreciate you coming tonight to the live show. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I think it's I think it's time to wrap it up. We're done. Let's go. Yeah.